Well, our next speaker is Dr. Robert Sharp. Many of you know Bob very well. He's been here with uh, the University of Missouri Division of Plant Sciences for many, many, many years. <laughs> Maybe I said too many, many, but. <laughs> well, he's a familiar face to all of us. Um, and he's been studying the physiology of roots. But he's also, I think he recently, uh, perhaps a year ago, two years ago, became the director for the well-known interdisciplinary plant group here, the IPG group here on campus. And today, Bob is going to talk about the physiology of root growth under water deficits, a critical but understudied component of adaptation to drought. So Bob. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, uh, invitation to speak at this symposium. Um, as Shubu said, I've been here for many years, but I've never given a talk which provides such an abrupt transition between what the previous speaker talked about and what I'm going to talk about. Um, so uh, bear with me, and hopefully, uh, um, hopefully you can um, make it through the talk. What I'd like to do is give um, a general introduction to the topic, and then one specific example of some detailed physiology um, that hopefully reveals um, the importance of studying roots and, and what we can gain from doing so. Um, before I talk about uh, the main topic, I just want to say a few words about the interdisciplinary plant group. Um, as indicated, I was uh, invited to be the director about a year ago, so I'm very proud to serve that role. The IPG was formed about 30, oh, just over 30 years ago and has grown to be now uh, 57 faculty groups across campus, across uh, different departments and colleges. And the purpose of the IPG is to facilitate interactive and cooperative and collaborative uh, research across the faculty and students uh, and staff on campus. And I think he does so exceedingly well and is recognized around the world for that. And we're very proud of our ranking among uh, universities for the impact of plant science research, as indicated uh, on the screen. And um, obviously with 57 faculty, there are many areas of expertise represented within the IPG. And uh, some of those are indicated here. And um, what I'm gonna talk about today combines uh, expertise in maize uh, and in root biology and in the uh, response of plants to drought. And it's an excellent example, I think, of the type of uh, interactive and interdisciplinary uh, work that can be facilitated by having a group like the IPG. So to the topic um, that I want to focus on, uh, physiology of root growth under drought, a critical but understudied component of adaptation to drought. Um, it's probably intuitively obvious that root growth and root development is critically important to plant performance under drought. Obviously, roots are the organ that take up water from the soil. And under dry conditions, um, it's well known, this is a figure, a classic figure from 1926 uh, for maize, uh, it's well known that um, roots of maize and many other species show increased uh, rooting development and increased depth of rooting under drought conditions. And that's illustrated here for a, a maize plant which is eight weeks old in the field. Um, the roots of the plant under a dry land condition have penetrated uh, more deeply and broadly into the soil profile. My colleague Richard Richards, who spoke here at our IPG symposium last year from Australia, um, in a review article he wrote here, listed what he viewed as the 10 most important uh, components of uh, plant adaptation to drought, and three of those involve the root system, what I'm going to be talking about today. And as another example, John Kierkegaard, another colleague from Australia who actually is one of our keynote speakers at this year's IPG symposium coming up at the end of May, um, modeled and estimated that in typical dryland wheat production in Australia, uh, an additional just 10 centimeters of rooting depth um, can lead, result in a 10 to 20% increase in grain yield. That's because those roots get down deep at the end of the season and still manage to take up some water at the time of reproductive development and grain development. So rooting the, 
the response of root growth and the regulation of root growth is, a, is indeed a critical component of how plants respond to drought. Unfortunately, it's really been very much understudied and is, is, is vastly uh, understudied and, and, and little understood. And the reason is primarily is because roots are very difficult to study. Obviously, roots are underground. That in, it makes them difficult immediately. They can go very deep into the soil. Uh, this eight-week-old maize plant I mentioned here, the roots are already around three feet, and a maize plant can easily penetrate six feet into the soil, and other species, obviously trees of interest to this audience, can penetrate much further than that. Um, so it's not easy to study. Um, root systems are very complex, as also illustrated by this diagram, and there are different types of roots that respond differently, um, and different species have different types of root systems, and um, that adds to, further to the complexity. Now what I'm going to talk about today is that some types of roots uh, have the ability to adapt and grow through dry soil conditions and it allows them to reach moisture in deeper soil profiles under drought conditions. And I'm going to focus on maize or corn and talk about two types of roots, the primary root of a developing seedling and the nodal or crown roots um, that form the structure, uh, the core structure of the root system of more mature plants. Now before getting into any details, I want to illustrate again that this is an opportunity for a collaborative group like the IBG to come together to work on this uh, complex study, especially if we're going to move from model systems in the lab, which is what my own program has focused on, out to the field where the question is much more difficult to study and much more complex um, because once you move to the field you have to consider all those other things that happen in the field, soil relations, temperature, soil physics, obviously nutrition um, and biotic interactions with insects, microbes, pathogens, etc. And so this is an ideal opportunity for a collaborative group to come to be together to begin to work on this topic. We're, I've been here for a long time, as was mentioned, focusing on model systems. As a team, we're really just coming together with um, s including some relatively new recent members of the team, and that includes my colleague here, Felix Fritchie, who uh, led the effort to establish this network of so-called rainout shelters, which are essentially mobile greenhouses um, that cover the move down the tracks and cover the crop when it rains. And we can use this system to impose a, a controlled and um, determined drought on the um, crop in the field. And really, this facility is essential. Uh, I mean, the topic of this symposium is obviously about drought and flooding. Sometimes it rains too much, and if we're trying to do drought experiments in the field, uh, that makes life very difficult. And um, especially if we're going to study something as complex as root development under field conditions, we need uh, reproducible controlled conditions, and this facility allows us um, to do that. The group um, initiated some efforts uh, uh, already to uh, bring a team together. We had a Mizzou Advantage uh, workshop on this topic that was held in April of last year. And the IPG has an annual symposium on different topics in plant biology. And uh, the topic in the coming symposium in May of 2013 uh, is again on root biology. And this is a third in a really now an international series on root biology. And I'll advertise that at the end of the talk. Now, moving to some more um, specifics. I mentioned there's two types of roots that I'm going to focus on. The, the first is the primary root of developing seedlings. Uh, this is in maize again, and uh, this is plotting the elongation rate of the shoot and the primary root of a young maize seedling as a function of the water status of the tissue, moving from a well-watered control situation through to quite severe water stress conditions. And as you can see from the graph and from the photograph, the primary root of a developing seedling has a superior ability to adapt and grow under water stress conditions. In fact, the root will continue to grow under conditions that are causing twice as severe a stress within the plant as the shoot. The shoot stops at this point here and the root continues to a much lower tissue uh, water status. And uh, that's illustrated by the photograph that the primary root is the only part of the seedling that has the ability to grow under this condition. Obviously that's important. If the primary root of a germinating seedling doesn't manage to find some water uh, before the shoot emerges uh, and transpiration begins, then the, the seedling is going to die. Um, now this is a fairly extreme um, condition for most agricultural practices in this country, um, but it's, it's a model system that allows us to 
uh, imposed very defined, reproducible, and relatively easy experimental conditions in the lab to study the physiology of root growth and development. And my lab has used this as a model system for many years. What the uh, team is coming together to begin to work on are the nodal roots of maize. Uh, these are the roots that are produced from the stem nodes. The initial nodes are underground, and as you'll see in the next photograph, later nodes are above ground. And these are the roots that form the framework of the mature root system. And as you can see from this uh, classic figure published by Westgate and Boyer here, again, it's plotting elongation rate as a function of water status. The nodal roots also have a superior ability to maintain elongation under dry conditions. So the growth of the leaf, of the stem, and of the reproductive structures is exceedingly sensitive to the development of water stress, but the nodal roots over that same range uh, have the ability to maintain elongation. Now ultimately they slow down and, and um, stop growing, and I'll elaborate on this in a second. Now to try to illustrate the importance of these roots, well actually before I say that, I'm going to illustrate the importance of these roots, but I want to point out that these two papers that are cited here are the only papers in the entire literature on the physiology of nodal root uh, growth adaptation to drought in the entire global literature. One of those is mine from my PhD thesis, um, and then subsequently from uh, John Boyer's lab, my postdoctoral mentor, who was at the University of Illinois at the time. And then uh, there are no other papers, which is an astonishing um, omission when you consider how important these roots are. As I said, these are the roots that form the framework. These are the roots that go down six feet into the soil. But because of the way they are developed over time uh, from the successive stem nodes, uh, as I said, the initial ones are developed in the surface soil. Later ones are actually developed above the soil and have to actually grow through the air first before even penetrating into the soil. And you can imagine under a drought condition, this surface soil may become exceedingly dry or and hot and hard, and if those roots don't have the ability to penetrate into the soil, then the plant loses the ability to develop the majority of its root system. And in fact, that can happen. There is a condition called rootless corn syndrome, which happens under extremely dry conditions, um, sometimes in Missouri, and uh, this is uh, these plants, this is a study from Iowa, uh, these plants were dug up out of the field, and um, as you can see, the primary root system here, the seedling root system, has grown well uh, earlier on. But this first generation of nodal roots, so these are the ones that are actually are under the surface um, of the soil, have completely failed to grow, as you can see here. You get these very short, stunted roots. And if that condition persists, then as I said, then the vast majority of the root system fails to develop. And in addition to obvious, uh, severe impact on water uptake and nutrient uptake capacity by the developing crop, um, the plants are also uh, highly vulnerable to lodging. And as you can see from this picture here, the, they just lose the support structure and if a wind comes through, the plants can just fall over. I would point out one other thing, uh, Bruce Hibbard, one of my colleagues in the USDA group on campus here, um, works on corn rootworm um, effects, damage, and um, it happens that these nodal roots are also the primary target of corn rootworm and um, corn rootworm damage can have exactly the same effect as this, and obviously the two conditions together would be um, even worse, and uh, Bruce and I are co-advising a, a student um, to begin to look at the uh, interaction of drought with corn rootworm damage on um, effects on nodal root development. So as I said, it's an extremely important um, class of roots that astonishingly has received uh, virtually no um, attention in the literature. So that's what, as a group, we would like to start um, doing. As I indicated, my own thesis work many, many years ago was on these roots for the reasons I've given. And I haven't worked on it in between because they're very complex roots to study. Uh, developmentally, it's complex. As I said, these roots are uh, produced uh, sequentially through the development of the stem. And uh, it, it just it adds to the complexity that I've tried to sort of convey of the difficulty of studying roots. But as a team, we're, we're going to try and tackle that question. Now, I'd like to, if you can bear with me, um, you, give you one example of the type of thing that we are studying. Um, this is more focused on the work in my lab, but it, it is a project that we are extending out to the field with some um, 
uh, uh, doctoral fellowship support from Pioneer. So I'll just give you this slide first just to orient you to the basic uh, regulation of plant cell expansion. Plant cells obviously surrounded by a, a fairly rigid cellulose cell wall um, and so plant cell expansion involves a combination of biophysical and metabolic factors. Uh, biophysics as in generated by the turgor pressure inside the cell that is, is exerting a force on the cell wall and essentially stretches the cell wall. But that stretching of the cell wall is not just um, physical, um, it involves metabolism, and uh, this extremely simplified diagram um, illustrates um, some of the complexity of the uh, chemistry within the cell wall structure. And I just w included this really just to um, highlight the role of these so-called expansin proteins. These are proteins that were discovered by Dan Cosgrove of Penn State University um, a long time ago now and uh, are believed to be one of the key wall loosening factors. So these proteins somehow act to loosen these um, connecting tethers within the um, cell wall structure and allow the cell wall to um, slip apart under the uh, physical influence of turgor pressure. Now this looks a complicated slide, but really it isn't that complicated. This is uh, now look, talking about the primary root model system that we work on in the lab. And just to orient you, these are, this is the root tip of a well-watered a control root or of a root growing under quite severe water stress in the lab environment. And um, we've placed these marks along the surface of the root, and this is a, a time zero and this is three hours later. And you can get a visual impression from the separation of these marks where cell expansion is occurring within the root tip. So the root growth zone of a primary root of a maize plant um, occurs over around 12 millimeters, this apical region of the root. This is a root lying on its side. And if we plot the root tip as the origin, we can plot from the calculation of the displacement of these marks, we can plot the um, profile of the cell expansion rate. So cells are produced here in the meristematic region and as the cells are displaced away from the root tip by their own growth and by the production of new cells, which pushes the more mature cells away, they accelerate and reach a maximum, a very fast growth rate actually, 40% per hour. So cells at this location are increasing in length by 40% in one hour. And then they decelerate and stop growing at around when they are around 12 millimeters from the apex. Now this control, well-watered uh, profile, was first described back in the 1950s. What hadn't been described until this paper from my lab, um, published now a long time ago, but was the um, profile of a water stress root. But you can see from the photograph that growth cell expansion in the water stress root is, is occurring in a very localized zone near the apex, and this is quantified here. And what we discovered is quite remarkably that in those first few millimeters, under really quite severe water stress conditions, cell expansion was unaffected. And my lab has worked on the mechanisms that are contributing to that growth maintenance in that apical region for many years. And um, we, I'm not gonna talk about that today. I'll be happy to talk to anybody who's interested about that later. What I wanna focus on is some new work that we're doing is why is cell expansion under water stress not maintained in this basal half of the growth zone? And if we could understand that question, perhaps we might be able to modify um, plant root growth under drought to actually improve root growth and, and have root growth that's even less sensitive to drought conditions. So I'm gonna focus a question, interest on why is cell expansion not occurring un, in the water stressed root in this condition where growth is actually most rapid under well watered control conditions. Again, this looks very complicated, but I'll just try to tell you the basics. This is a measure of, again, the extensibility of the cell walls. These cell walls have to show um, ex expansion under the influence of turgor pressure. And we can measure that by clamping pieces of root tissue in this uh, extensiometer system and apply a, a force and measure the increase in length of the little segment of root over time. And that's all you're already seeing here. This is increase in length as a function of time. And all I really want to say is, um, actually, in the region that we're going to focus on, this is the basal half of the growth zone. These are the, this is the well-watered control tissue, which 
in this particular experiment is showing extensibility. And in the water stress tissue, there is a complete loss of extensibility. So this tissue is not capable of, ex of extending under these experimental conditions. Now this occurs despite the fact, this is why I highlighted those expansin proteins in the earlier figure. If we extract the amount of expansin protein and measure its activity from this region of the root, you can see that actually the water stress roots have more than double the activity of these proteins. So there's a, a great ability potentially to expand, but something is preventing the cells from, the cell walls from expanding. And this suggests is some change in the chemistry or the composition of the cell wall. And we published a couple of years ago a uh, gene expression, a transcriptome analysis, um, that suggested that one of the factors that might be modified that's preventing root cells from expanding under water stress is uh, the production of these ferrolate compounds illustrated here. And this schematic just illustrates that ferrolate compounds are known to, in monocot plants, including maize, to play a role in cross-linking uh, uh, the polysaccharides within the cell wall structure and preventing the cell wall from um, stretching, from slipping, from the molecules from slipping apart. And this transcriptome analysis suggested that there may be an enhanced production and accumulation of these compounds that might be causing uh, the limitation of cell expansion in water stress roots. So I'm going to show you just very briefly some evidence that that hypothesis was true. Um, I'm going to show you in the next slide um, some of the spatial pattern of the com composition of these compounds in the root tip and an experiment where we used an enzymatic treatment to remove the ferrolates from the cell wall to see if we could restore the ability of the tissue to grow. So this figure shows uh, from the green fluorescence you're looking at, this green fluorescence is indicative of ferrolate levels in the root tip. This is the apical uh, 12 millimeters or so of the uh, root tip. This is at the time of transplanting to water stress and over the following 48 hours. And I just really want to draw your attention to what happens in this region here. This is the region where growth slows down under water stress and is inhibited. And you can see a progressive increase in this green fluorescence. And this is also shown in these cross sections um, where the water stress is the middle column. And you can obviously see compared to the, there's two well watered controls, I won't explain why, but um, they're basically the same. And the fluorescence levels are much higher in the water stressed route in that region, the second half of the growth zone. So as I said, we've used a, an enzymatic uh, experimental uh, treatment to see if we can remove those ferrolate compounds from the cell walls. And um, this enzyme is called ferrolyl esterase. And you can see that it is actually very effective in removing ferrolates from the cell wall. Here's a cross section of a water stressed route in the region where growth is inhibited. Um, high levels of that green fluorescence and after a treatment with this ferrolyl esterase we've successfully removed much of that ferrolate from the cell wall. We then clamp that tissue in the extensiometer system I briefly mentioned before to see whether or not removal of ferrolates from the cell wall has restored the ability of the tissue to grow. And the results were actually spectacularly successful. Again this is extension as a function of time um, all you really need to see is that, as I've already shown you before, normal water stressed tissue from that region of the root has a very low ability to extend. This blue line is the, the blue dash line is the well watered control, which is extending rapidly. The water stressed tissue shows very low extension. However, following removal of the ferrolates from the cell wall, the water stressed tissue is now growing the solid red line at exactly the same rate as the um, well watered control. Now that's in the region, what we call region two. This is a zone of m maximum, very high elongation rate of well watered roots, but this progressive inhibition of occurs under water stress. Now, what about in the next region? Region three is the zone where growth is actually completely inhibited under water stress, but is the normal growth deceleration zone of a control route. Now in this case, the ferrolyl esterase treatment had absolutely no impact on the 
um, cessation of growth in the water stress tissue. So this indicates that, there are, that this ferrolate um, chemistry in the cell wall is not what is, com what is limiting growth. Once growth has completely ceased, there are other factors that are determining growth inhibition. But there is, uh, in the normal zone of growth deceleration in well water, there is a significant effect in the well water control. So to summarize what I've said, uh, this repeats what I've just said. So what we're most interested in is this region two, where growth is normally very fast in the well watered route, but for some reason fails to grow under water stress. And we believe that we have identified a significant limiting uh, factor that is preventing uh, growth from occurring in this region. Because if we remove ferrolates from the cell wall, we can substantially restore the extensibility of the tissue in this region. However, in this region here, where growth is normally completely inhibited under water stress, there are, must be other um, wall tightening mecha mechanisms that are preventing growth from occurring. Now, those data, hopefully you are, um, got the gist of what I was trying to convey to you. Um, those are you know, very specialized experiments in the lab using an enzymatic treatment on isolated root segments, and we, we got we were very excited about the results we obtained. Does that translate through to growth of an intact plant? Growth is really very complex, and what we did in those uh, lab experiments was isolate to a few specific components. Um, would removal of ferrolates, um, or reducing the level of ferrolates in an intact plant, would that actually lead to improved root elongation? And we're fortunate that uh, Ron Phillips' lab in uh, University of Minnesota published this paper a couple of years ago where they developed some ferrolate-deficient mutants of maize. Their interest in this was not on growth regulation. It was on cell wall digestibility for um, forage production reasons. But we took advantage of this to see whether or not um, these so-called SFE mutants may exhibit increased root elongation both under well watered conditions, but particularly um, we might see enhanced root elongation under water stress. And in, we're very excited by these results that in, uh, actually that both of those predictions are true. Uh, what you're looking at here are two different ferrolate deficient mutants, M1, M2, compared to the non-mutant wild type. This is under well watered and under water stress conditions. And as you can see from the green fluorescence, under well watered conditions, both of the mutants show evidence of less fluorescence, less ferrolate accumulation, and both show a significant, around about 20% increase in root elongation rate. Under water stress, for reasons we don't understand, only one of the mutants is ferrolate deficient, M2, and that mutant shows an even greater uh, reduction. We've done this experiment several times now, and the average promotion of root elongation rate is almost 30% under quite severe water stress conditions. So. We're, that's very um, pleasing that we can uh, achieve the same result in an intact system uh, by modification of this cell wall chemistry. Now, what, I tried, what I'm trying to do in this talk is convey how we uh, would like to move from some of that example um, and other examples of fundamental studies of growth regulation under very controlled lab conditions and begin to move to address the much more complex question of how growth is regulated under drought in the field. And I believe, yes, so Hallie Thompson, raise your hand. Hallie's a PhD student that's supported by this uh, pioneer fellowship I mentioned that began her program about a year ago. And the, the implication of these seedling results I just showed you is that if we can uh, improve root growth uh, of roots, that roots actually do grow quite well under drought. As I emphasized at the beginning of the talk, most tissues are really very sensitive to drought, to water deficits, that leaf stem reproductive development. So maybe this finding that ferrolate accumulation is a key factor limiting plant growth under drought, maybe that actually is even more critical and more, or more relevant and more important for the growth of the aerial parts of the plant. So this study, this is an initial preliminary study that Halley conducted last summer. Um, we, the purpose was to look at both, extending that finding from the primary root to the nodal roots, but also to the leaves of these maize plants under drought conditions. So the data I'm going to show you were taken at this relatively early stage of development. 
under, uh, by th at that point, even though it's a severe drought year, this is under relatively mild drought conditions at this time. Now, these are the nodal root data that showed no effect of the mutations compared to the wild type. Now, this is an entirely, it's not a disappointing result. It's actually an entirely expected result. This is the same figure I showed you earlier on. Elongation rate as a function of water status. The nodal roots, the reason we're interested in them is because they can grow under mild water stress conditions. And that's the condition that is represented by this stage of this experiment. So we didn't expect to see any impact of water stress on nodal root development, and that's true. This is the well-watered, this is the water stressed in the wild type. So there's no impact, and therefore we didn't really expect to see a mutant phenotype because there was no inhibition to recover from, and that's in exactly the case. Both mutants showed no significant impact um, compared to the growth of the wild type. But as you can see, in the same plants at the same time, we would expect to see significant inhibition of leaf and stem growth because those organs are much more sensitive to drought. And that's indeed what we see. So we're on this part of the curve, and this is leaf area at this time of harvest is reduced by around 30% compared to the well-watered control. And similarly for stem growth, which is just reduced by about 20% stem height at this time of the experiment. When we look at the mutants, these data are really very exciting. The, both of the ferrolate deficient mutants showed, and these are grown side by side in a randomized design in the field, um, showed side by side with the wild type, um, showed no impact of this mild stress condition on either leaf development or on stem height. So just like we saw in the very controlled model s seedling system studies of the primary route, apparently um, decreasing ferrolate levels in the cell walls has substantially reduced, or completely under this condition, reduced the impact of drought on uh, leaf and stem development. And this is one of the first examples, actually, in the literature of actually m modifying something that actually makes plants grow substantially better under drought conditions. So we're quite excited about the result. Now, as a physiologist, I'm very excited about the result. To try to give it some um, more crop production relevance uh, to this audience, I just want to leave you with a couple of uh, discussion of wh what are the implications of these findings. We seem to have identified a key parameter that is determining whether tissues can grow well under mild water stress conditions, or in the case of roots, even under severe water stress conditions. Now you might think intuitively, well, that's great, we make plants grow better under drought, like this, compared to the normal inhibition of leaf development. But actually, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, this inhibition of leaf growth under drought is um, understood, or at least um, interpreted, to probably be part of the plant adaptation to a drought condition. Plants may be deliberately slowing down leaf development for two reasons. One is to reduce the development of transpirational surface area, so to res restrict water loss. But also, if you want to maintain, or as I showed in the very beginning of the talk, actually even promote root development, that carbon assimilation has to come from somewhere. If you're going to grow more roots, you probably have to reduce the growth of the shoot. And that's our sort of view of this integrated whole plant response, is the plant is deliberately slowing down uh, growth of some of the aerial parts, at least, uh, in order to maintain and promote root development. So relieving, removing the breaks, as I put it, relieving growth inhibition of the aerial parts of the plant may actually have negative consequences for plant uh, response to drought, particularly if the uh, interest is on grain yield. As I said at the beginning, just 10 centimeters more rooting depth can lead to 10 to 20 percent increase in grain yield. That's because those roots find water at the end of the season. So you want deep roots at the end of the season, and this might actually prevent that from happening. We don't know that yet. On the other hand, if the interest is on vegetative biomass development for biofuel production, then actually it might be very advantageous to grow leaves as fast as possible during a drought period. Um, so the question is really quite complex as a w from an agronomic perspective as to whether this is an advantageous or, or disadvantageous result. From our perspective as physiologists, it doesn't matter. We, it's important to understand what the normal regulation of the growth response is, and then perhaps that can be modified 
to our advantage. Under certain circumstances, we might want to decrease it. Under other circumstances, you might want to increase it. So there's a lot of questions there to be asked uh, down the road. And as I said, this work is being supported by Pioneer, and they're interested in pursuing those sort of questions. So I'd just like to finish by uh, thanking the people who did the specific work I've talked about today. Halle, I introduced, is doing the uh, moving this work to the field. Uh, Minio Yamaguchi, a postdoc, who's doing the work in the lab. Um, Justin Garner, a technician who built the extensometer system. Um, the work with Halley is co-advised with Felix Fritchie, who I don't think is here, Felix, um, who's our, uh, allowing us to extend this work out to the field and uh, collaborators um, around the country that are helping with the uh, ferrolite chemistry work. And as I said, I would leave you with an advertisement of our uh, IPG Symposium this coming May. We have a fantastic uh, lineup of international speakers, and it's the end of May, and invite you all to um, join us at that event. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bob. What a fascinating story. I think we have multiple questions. Bill? Uh, hold on a second. Let me bring the microphone to you. Well, as, as Bill said, that was more of a comment than a question. Um, what you've said is absolutely correct. Um, we, we generally have taken very little advantage, I think, of the um, native com variability in response. I mean, as an example, in corn, um, there, is, there are varieties of corn that are known as Indian corn, which are used by the Native Americans and planted in very dry areas in Mexico and, and uh, southwest U.S. No, I was going to say, but those have totally different characteristics of some of these. For example, they used to plant them like about six inches down in the ground, so that, and they had the ability to grow a very long hypocotyl. So what it did was it allow the root system time to get down and find some water before the shoot emerges. And yeah, but those type of characteristics are not in our cultivated uh, varieties at all. They've been bred out or never, never there in the first place. And so there is huge complexity out there that hasn't been taken advantage of. So, I mean, your point. The other thing to say, though, I was the the lab part of this. I really didn't mention it was on the slide. Was um, was a collaboration with Monsanto. So I was doing some work 
I'm not going to go into details, but doing some work with some of these um, drought-tolerant transgenic maize lines that Monsanto have been developing. And what you're describing is, is a huge problem for companies um, because the complexity of the, well, the type of plant you want to produce depends upon the type of drought that is experienced. And that varies, it will vary locally, but also certainly varies in different parts of the, the world. And so, I mean, their development, the, the, they have a, a, their lead line is, is already being sort of publicly tested. I think it's being released in 2013. That's designed for a very specific environment, like in the Nebraska type environment, and, and probably not suitable for most other environments. It's a very specific targeted environment because of the type of drought conditions that occur in that specific place. I mean, they've tested that line all over the world. I've seen some of that data, and I mean, it, it works in some places and certainly doesn't in others. That's not surprising because of what you're describing. So it's a, it's a really very complex question. But I'm sure there's a lot of opportunity out there to learn more. Well, again, thanks, Bob.